Good to go. All right, guys. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here to tell you about somebody who has been very important to me throughout my life and uh, throughout my development, uh, my father, Chris Williams. Now, when I think of my father, the first thing I think of is this. Huh? Now, I don't know what your dads look like, but this is the epitome of my father. Giant eyes, goofy smile, a beard to extremity. My father was born in uh, May 27, 1955, and he lived his life in a small town called Canterbury, New Hampshire. And I know I'm the only person here from New Hampshire, but as many of you probably can assume, it's pretty, uh, it's not a lot to do, it's not a lot going on. You really gotta be somebody who enjoys either working with your hands or manipulating you know, mechanical objects or just going out and walking in the woods or farming. My father falls under this uh, final juncture here. My father is not like other dads in the most uh, stereotypical sense. He doesn't watch sports. He's not into cars, he's into tractors. He's not into, uh, you know, he's not into big manly things and meat and bacon. He's into vegetables and spinach smoothies and gardening. Now, this has affected me in a few different ways, which I'm gonna to get to a little bit later on in this little, uh, this little charade here. But for starters, it's really changed how I perceive what it is to be a man and also what it is to be, in, or what is important and uh, related to other people. And uh, what my father always taught me is that kindness is the, the utmost importance when related to other individuals and when related to life. Um, so my father was the middle child in a group of uh, five, uh, I mean, uh, five siblings. Uh, this was also during the baby boomer era, so that was kind of a standard family size. Um, being the middle child probably affected his life in ways that I'm not even aware of, but uh, for him, it made him have, have to be aware of both those who are his betters, so to speak, and his lowers, so to speak. Now, my father attended high school and graduated and was planning on just becoming a mechanic for the majority of his life. I mean, like, as I said, he enjoyed working with his hands, he liked small engine work. Then one day, he went into the mechanic shop, the smell of oil made him nauseous. I'm not talking like a little bit queasy, like you're doing a speech nauseous. I'm talking violently ill, vomit on the floor, projectile, you know, we're talking like Linda Blair style here. So he decided that instead he would just get into teaching because he liked kids. He was good working with them. He was good with people. He was a kind, open man. So it seemed only necessary to get, or it seemed only logical to get into a, a profession which kind of takes advantage of those sort of things. And that's where he met my mother. My mother, from New York, she was a teacher as well. She worked in elementary education in Pinnacook, uh, New Hampshire, after she got her master's degree. And my father went with, uh, you know, in special education, worked with uh, kids with disabilities, as it was called back in the day. They fell in love, decided to make a family. And I come along. Now, here's where I can actually kind of expound upon why my father is so important to my life and why I feel like he is so different than what many others have experienced um, from their fathers. As I stated before, first and foremost, my dad was very gender atypical. He was, uh, he was actually the stay-at-home dad. My mother worked, he didn't have a degree, and he didn't make much money doing what he was doing, so my mother went off to work five days a week. Well, she's a teacher, so it was more like seven days a week. But <laughs> my father stayed at home. We had Mr. Mom action going on there. So my father cooked, he cleaned, he took care of myself and my little brother. He basically uh, raised us, I'd say, 80% of the time. Which is not to say my mother didn't have her fair share and didn't do a extreme amount of work on us. But my father was always there. And he was always the one sort of guiding us around. And he never told us that we had to be like him. He told us that we just had to think. <laughs> not like him, but you just had to think. And you had to use this sort of access of thought to put yourself in other's shoes. My father's an old school gay geek. He's an old school farming kind of guy. And what that means to me is that he thinks of the person and of their relationship to their community and their immediate surroundings before he thinks of how he would think in their shoes. So not to put himself in other people's shoes, but merely to accept them as they come and as they seem as a person, rather than their various attributes that make up their personality. My father, He's always a big fan of this sort of quasi-transcendentalist philosophies that you see in New England. Your Thoreau's, your Emerson's, um, your Frost's, what have you. 
Um, there's a man named Scott Nearing that lived in coastal Maine, and he uh, lived to be about 100, uh, 100 100.5 years old. He's big on clean living and honest living. And there's a phrase, a quotation, that I've always taken to mean, basically to represent what my father means to me and what has meant to me and what he's taught me and what he's taught me to consider. And that is to do the best you can with what you have. Be kind to be.